Hello everyone, this is Joshua Smith of Apollo's Artifacts. I want to uh, discuss taxes today. Um, I am a libertarian, of course, a principled libertarian. I don't believe in taxation at all. But we're going to get into some issues about um, a particular uh, bane of mine is uh, listening to conservative talk radio show hosts who like to uh, bloviate on and on and on for hours about how, quote, the poor don't pay any taxes. I mean, if you've ever listened to any of them talk about taxes, it's usually one of the first things they say. The poor don't pay any taxes. The poor don't pay any taxes, right? Now, of course, what they're talking about, they're talking about income taxes, which, of course, they're technically wrong about that issue, too, because anyone who makes money pays out income taxes all throughout the year, and then when they file for an income tax return, they get that back at during the next year. But of course what they're losing is the use of that money throughout the entire year, whereas they could be uh, you know, redirecting that towards other things that they would prefer to put their money toward. So in the interest of this, I'm actually going to read an article from uh, PBS, which you know, ordinarily I would not read anything from them, but uh, this is a particularly good article. And it's called, um, How Much Do the Poor Actually Pay in Taxes? probably more than you think. And it begins with an editor's note. Makers versus takers. It's the cliche dividing line between those of us who contribute to the economy and those who supposedly leech off it. The assumption is simple and stark. The former pay taxes, the latter don't, and live off those who do. But it turns out that even the poorest among us pay a high proportion of their income in taxes. Vanessa Williamson of the Brookings Institution and Economic Think Tank decided to study the data and has now written Read My Lips, Why Americans Are Proud to Pay Taxes, a book full of surprises about who pays taxes and how much they pay. The following piece highlights the greatest surprise of all. And uh, this is a five-page article. I'm only going to read some selections from it just to uh, help make the point. It starts off, this is uh, from Paul Solomon, economics correspondent. Quick, think of a taxpayer. Did you imagine a middle-class person? puzzling over the income tax returns, or maybe a homeowner looking at the property tax assessment. If you are like most Americans, you probably did not think of a mother putting gas in the tank of the family car or a retail worker having wages withheld for Social Security and Medicare. Because people in the United States associate tax paying with the income tax, they underestimate the cost of the many other taxes they pay, especially the payroll taxes, sales taxes, and gas taxes that fall heavily on lower income people. In reality, Low-income Americans pay a lot in taxes, and their role in paying for schools, roads, and other pu public services largely goes unrecognized. All to told, those in the bottom fifth of earners pay almost a fifth of their income in taxes. According to the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, the lowest-income quintile, those making less than $19,000 a year, pay almost 11% of their income in state and local taxes. And, of course, that's a lot more in a state like... Um, Tennessee, where I live, where we have one of the highest uh, sales taxes in the United States. I think it's uh, second, maybe. Uh, working people, even if they don't make enough money to pay federal income tax, also pay payroll taxes that contribute to Social Security and Medicare. And anyone who drives a car pays gas taxes. The old cliche really does hold true. The only thing as inevitable as death are taxes. And uh, John Stossel, the uh, great a uh, former liberal turned libertarian has uh, made a, a really really good uh, video showing uh, you know from the time that he uh, wakes up in the morning till the time he goes to bed at night he's taxed on all kinds of ludicrous and absurd things uh, all throughout the day as we all indeed are and I don't by any means endorse um, every claim or the entirety of this uh, article but uh, I do think it's important to uh, point this out you know that the uh, conservative uh, talk radio show hosts really, you know, should tone down the rhetoric a little bit when they're out there yelling about um, how the poor don't pay anything in taxes. It's just really um, not true. And they need to be more specific about what groups of poor they are referring to and, um, you know, which, which uh, portions of the rich that they're referring to in terms of uh, those who pay, you know, the large majority of taxes. And I moved from that to uh, something from the Tax Foundation uh, State and Local Sales Tax Rates of uh, 2016 by Scott uh, Drinkard and Nicole Keating. And it uh, shows here how, uh, for example, the state where I currently reside, Tennessee, 
has uh, you know by various calculations either the first or second highest uh, rate of sales taxes and indeed many of the uh, cities here in Tennessee also impose a sales tax beyond above and beyond the uh, the state tax that you face this article has a really good uh, table that you can refer to to see where uh, various states uh, rank in terms of uh, state and local taxes and uh, I can say that at least here in uh, Tennessee, it creates some interesting situations where there are particular items that are not uh, taxed in the same way in Kentucky. So people travel across the border to buy things there and then bring them back into the state. Technically, I think they're actually supposed to pay some kind of tax on that. But uh, as far as I know, it's one of those things that's just mostly ignored and no, no one really pays as far as I know anyway. I have another article here from uh, something called City Lab. <clears throat> dot com and uh, this is titled how local sales taxes target the poor and widen the income gap um, it points out that a uh, state sales tax on food and other necessities place a higher burden on poor families and uh, one of the interesting ways that this particular article breaks down the division on this um we can uh, combine let's say the first uh, four of the um, of, let me see, uh, economic divisions here. Say it starts with less than 18,000, 18,000 to 33,000, 33,000 to 54,000, 54,000 to 88,000. If you combine those four categories, the average state and local tax expenditure for uh, them is right at 10%. But when you look at the, say, top 1% of earners, uh, $419,000 per year and above, they end up paying only 5.4% of their income in state and uh, local taxes. So again, this just points up the, the thing that I'm trying to uh, bring about here, which is when you hear the conservative talk radio show host screaming about how the poor don't pay any taxes, it is technically and literally absolutely not true. And this is where uh, some have the, the term they refer to, you know, state and local taxes uh, like this as regressive taxes because they do end up literally uh, punishing uh, people on the lower end of the economic spectrum uh, more than anyone at the top. And, uh, you know, beyond that, it would just make more sense, I think, to have a uh, you know, groceries, especially basic grocery items, uh, not taxed at all. I mean, I guess you could say particular luxury foods or something like that. Maybe you could have those taxed at some certain rate or whatever. But um, ideally, you know, I would like to reduce everyone's taxes that they pay. And beyond that, of course, not have them pay taxes at all. But that's just, uh, you know, my approach to it. And this uh, problem is one that... Uh, bears out uh, they have a an interesting table here breaking it down uh, by property taxes sales and excise taxes and income taxes and uh, indeed the lowest 20 percent of earners do not pay very much at all in the form of income taxes but they pay uh, many multiples of times more in the form of sales and excise taxes and um, property taxes than do the top one percent the top four percent and the top 15 percent so that's interesting and uh, one of the reasons for this probably is that um, you know the sales tax is a lot more of a hidden tax that people don't you know keep a running tabulation of throughout the year most people don't anyway and um, the uh, the federal income tax of course has a much more you know obvious and uh, overt you know example that pops in front of your uh, face once every year you know, depending on how you file, of course. But the, uh, the state and uh, local taxes are uh, really, really a big pain for poor people. And I have another one uh, here from January 2015 um, from CBS News. Are local taxes unfair to the poor? Ultimately, it comes to this uh, same conclusion, points out many of the same problems. And, uh, you know, of course, the, uh, the libertarian mantra, which is usually... You know, taxation is theft, taxation is theft. There's only so many times that you can say that and you see that people just simply don't get it. You know, sometimes you have to bring it into a, more of this, you know, uh, 
real world uh, material like this rather than just um, the theory because um, people really get this you know when it hits them in the pocketbook but you know people have this perception of taxes you know hey it's how we pay for roads it's how we pay for schools and all this kind of thing it's how we pay for military defense and so on and then uh, they get really upset when you start talking about how no one needs to pay any taxes at all right they they do get it when you start talking about how the poor are being treated unfairly there's just uh, not much sympathy out there for the devil when you talk about how well, the wealthier having to pay, uh, you know, X and X amount in uh, taxes, uh, people just don't really care about that, you know, unless they happen to fall into those categories. And then they're like, yeah, you know, that is a problem. But um, people beyond those uh, brackets, um, they <laughs> they just don't get it. Have another article. This one is from March uh, 1st, 1998 by William Gale from uh, Brookings, and it's called Don't Buy the Sales Tax. And he talks about how, you know, every few years there's like this cycle to this where people say the flat tax is the way to go. Other people say that there needs to be a retail sales tax. And one of the things that's uh, missed about this, I think this article points it out uh, pretty well, but, uh, you know, it isn't perfect, of course. But um, think about all of these sales taxes and any kind of tax imposed upon any kind of a corporation or business or individual as a burden that's being placed upon the economy overall. It is something that uh, causes it to slow down. It creates a drag effect. It's a big problem because no matter what happens with any of the taxes, they're going to necessarily have to shift off those costs to someone else. Someone is always going to pay for them no matter what. Now, whether that uh, comes about in the form of, say, um, fewer hirings or increased uh, layoffs and firings, or it comes in the form of you know, increase costs for whatever product is involved, whatever it is, they're going to make up that difference for the tax somewhere. Everybody is going to end up paying for it somewhere down the line. It's the same thing with um, creating a, uh, a minimum wage or increasing the minimum wage. You know, there's, just think about it in terms of a small business. Say you, you're an employer, you have 12 employees, they force you to raise the minimum wage to say, you know, the, the big thing going around right now is $15 per hour. I'm not sure what minimum wage is, but if it increases to that, just think that this business that employs 12 people currently will probably have to cut back to say 10 employees and in, uh, increase the cost of whatever product that they make. You know, there's going to be some combination of that or there's going to be a hiring freeze at this place. Say they keep the 12 employees. Well, they're most certainly not now going to go to 15 or 20 employees. He can't, you know, this uh, person, he or she will not be able to expand their business. And they're certainly not going to be able to decrease the cost of whatever product it is that they make. You know, and you're probably going to get a combination of all three of these things. You're going to have a hiring slowdown. You're going to have to cut back on, you know, your least productive employees, whoever they happen to be. And uh, you're going to have to increase the cost of whatever it is that you make. I mean, this is just common sense. It's embedded into the system. It, mathematically, it's, you know, the only things that can take place from it. But I will uh, skip down to the conclusion here of this. Uh, this is a 10-page article. As a replacement for the existing federal tax system, a national retail sales tax is a non-starter. After accounting for evasion, the conversion of state and local taxes, adjustments to keep government benefits constant, and plausible reductions in the tax base, the required rate would be sufficiently high to make enforcement too difficult and evasion too tempting. The historical record uh, should suggest caution in this regard. Uh, these problems with the sales tax do not apply that tax reform itself is a bad idea, improvements to the tax system are sorely needed. Other types of consumption taxes, like value-added taxes or variants of a flat tax, should receive careful consideration. Many of the gains of moving to a consumption tax could also be obtained through judicious modifications of the income tax. Since income tax reform may also generate much smaller transitional problems, it should be considered seriously and first. And um, in relation to that, I would say that I think, um, you know, what... Trump has uh, been able to put together here. Of course, it's not precisely what he wanted, you know, but it's the best uh, best that they could uh, come up with with a combination of the House and the Senate mess that they typically make out of everything. And I don't know exactly what the effects of it are going to be. I would estimate that there are going to be a lot of positive long-term effects from it, 
but it may take uh, several years before you see exactly what those are going to be. I know we've had some immediate effects like uh, companies like Apple saying they're going to bring back, um, you know, almost 300 billion dollars uh, from overseas back to the United States and other companies are increasing the wages that they're paying their workers and others are announcing, you know, thousands of new hirings that will take place in 2018 and all that kind of stuff. All those things are immediate, obvious and good effects, but we don't know exactly what all of the long term effects would be. I mean, if we judge based on, uh, you know, the Kennedy changes and the Reagan changes, then overall, you know, it will be good. But uh, all that remains to be seen, you know, precisely what will take place. Also have an article here from a Roger Olson, who I believe is uh, some kind of a lefty, but it's titled, uh, Is a Consumption Tax Fair? Starts off, I have argued here and elsewhere, e.g. in newspaper letters to the editor and guest columns, that income tax is the only fair tax because it's the only tax based solely on ability to pay. I might include luxury tax also, but I read out to the side here this is actually not true because there's all kinds of under the table or off the books ways to uh, make money and avoid taxation altogether, which I am not going to encourage, but I also am opposed to taxes. But I'm going to skip down to his conclusion here where he makes a couple of interesting points. Governments have gradually abolished many regressive taxes, ones not based on ability to pay. For example, when I was a kid growing up in a Midwestern city in the 1950s, my parents had to fill out a form annually stating all of their personal property items, furniture, car, jewelry, of which they had none, appliances, etc. That even included savings accounts. Then the county or state, and it doesn't matter to my point, and I don't remember which they were exactly, levied a tax on their personal property. This was a huge financial burden on them and us, their children. We were lower middle class, if not poor. My parents never had savings or disposable income, money to spend on non-necessities. I recall that one year the taxing government did not believe their report and sent an agent into our house to inspect it. I was home when that happened. He went through our drawers and cabinets and closets looking for unclaimed items such as jewelry, expensive clothes, etc. Of course, he found none and concluded that my parents had stated their personal property correctly. Sometime later, and I don't remember when, the government abolished that tax. It was extremely regressive. For example, suppose you were poor but inherited a piece of jewelry with sentimental value, such as your grandmother's wedding ring set. You had to declare it and pay a personal property tax on that annually. That tax had nothing whatever to do with ability to pay. That's why it was abolished, but the same principle applies to real estate property tax on homesteads and, I argue, sales tax on clothes, services such as plumbing repair, etc. Those should also be abolished because they are regressive. The only progressive taxes are income tax and luxury tax. And uh, I would uh, agree with him with uh, nixing the other forms of taxes, but also add to that the uh, income tax and luxury tax as well. But that's just me. And uh, I'll follow this up by uh, reading uh, portions of a, an opinion piece uh, published in Forbes uh, from August 14, 2016 uh, by John Tamney. Um, Gary Johnson is right about a consumption tax, but very wrong about the rate. So he starts here. Over the past week, Libertarian Party presidential nominee Gary Johnson, an embarrassing candidate, I must say, has promoted erasing the tax code in favor of a national sales tax on goods and services purchased. He's quite right that his proposed form of taxation is far superior to a graduated income tax proposed by Clinton or Trump, but it, and it's fairly easy to see why. First, a consumption tax doesn't penalize our work, while an income tax does. An income tax is a price or a penalty levied on work, while a consumption tax doesn't kick in unless we consume. But there's the rub. There's the trick. The poor have to buy food. They have to consume. They have to buy basic cloth items, basic socks, shoes, underwear. How are they going to avoid those kinds of things? And like I said, it's one-fifth of their income ends up being spent on the taxes for those low-level items, which, of course, don't affect uh, wealthy people at all. They're in, in, inconsequential. But uh, really, I agree with him on uh, everything else he says in the article, um, more or less. Uh, it's just that he misses the impact on the poorest uh, people that, uh, you know, attacks of this nature would have. And uh, another article, this is uh, from the Pew Charitable Trust's um, 
quote, uh, decried as unfair, taxes on groceries persist in some states. This is by Elaine Povich, August 16, 2016. And it has a uh, picture here. It says a uh, Republican state Senator Gerald Dial has repeatedly tried and failed to eliminate Alabama sales tax on groceries. He says the tax, quote, punishes those on fixed incomes. And I uh, agree with him there. And uh, that's very much at the heart of what I've been talking about overall. The article uh, begins, 13 states and many localities continue to tax the sale of groceries, even though the taxes disproportionately hurt the poor and may affect the quality, variety, and even the amount of food they can afford to put on the table. Because just think about it, all of the healthier uh, food items cost significantly more and the cheap garbage, um, you know, everybody can uh, can get and uh, eat to their heart's content, but much to their physical and mental health woes. The article goes on to uh, point out that, uh, you know, states may be looking at getting rid of sales taxes on groceries, but the calculus that they make is groceries are between one-sixth and one-seventh of all consumption within the states. And if they want to raise that same amount of money, they have to make that up somewhere else if they want to continue bloated government expenditure at the rates that they always want to continue them at and, of course, grow them inevitably. The article continues uh, further down. It's not just states that rely on grocery tax revenue. A new study titled Do Grocery Food Sales Taxes Cause Food Insecurity by four researchers led by Norbert Wilson of Auburn University finds that because counties and localities sometimes collect food taxes even if their states don't, people living in more than a third of the nation's roughly 3,000 counties are taxed at some level on the food that they buy at the store. The average tax rate is 4.3%, which translate, translates to more than $200 for a family with an annual grocery bill of $5,000. But in some places, such as Tuscaloosa County, Alabama, combined state and local taxes can be as high as 9%. And I move a bit further down here. It says, although families spend less um, on groceries, although, I guess, wait, poor families? They didn't say that than those with higher incomes, what they do spend accounts for a bigger share of their income. In fact, the lowest income Americans spent an average of $3,667 on food in 2014, which amounted to 34.1% of their income, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Middle income families, in contrast, spent an average of almost $6,000, but that was only 13.4% of their income. And the article points out that at least in the case of um, Alabama, were they to remove that particular tax, um, it would uh, cost the state um, a loss uh, somewhere between 650 and $700 million. But you notice the uh, craven nature of uh, politicians in general is they, they never consider, hey, let's reduce the state budget say 650 or $700 million in order to make up for this. They immediately want to look somewhere else to impose some other kind of tax on someone else to make them pay for this so-called uh, shortfall, which is actually, I'm sure, an unnecessary shortfall. If you could get into the budget and look deeply enough, you would easily find some place you could cut this uh, 650 to $700 million. And the uh, article actually does point out here that people who live uh, within a, you know, a, a decent proximity of the border to uh, Florida actually leave the state of Alabama in order to uh, buy their food there because that uh, state has no tax the same way that here in Tennessee people who live close to Kentucky often will go there and buy their uh, food and other items and then uh, bring them back. It says here that uh, people who live in, uh, let's see, it says uh, which Wichita State University study published earlier this year found that Kansans living near Colorado, Nebraska, and Missouri borders often cross over to buy groceries, uh, avoiding state and local taxes in their home state, which can run as high as 10.5%. But ultimately, all of this only covers uh, really the tip of the iceberg as to uh, why I have problems with uh, taxation. But uh, I thought that maybe it would help make the points about it a little more clear if we could go into some of the specifics related to it in the way uh, that it impacts uh, the poorest among us, as the left are fond of saying. And uh, that'll be it for this now. Thank you.